Hello everyone and good morning. Welcome to a um, webinar on WC2 Open Banking, where we hope to talk about digital transformation through PSD2. Uh, I hope everyone can see the results of the poll that we just um, um, completed uh, online. Thank you very much for everyone who voted. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? 51% uh, of today's um, attendees say that they haven't started um, on their journey towards uh, PSG2 compliance. Um, um, I think second in line was uh, those who were in progress and only 6% uh, say that they're already compliant. This is in fact a really good number uh, from the conversations we've had and from the survey results we've seen uh, those who uh, have complied um, are much less uh, in, in, in the other numbers and statistics that we've seen. Um, so before we um, start things off, let me introduce myself. I'm Seshika Fernando. I head the financial solutions um, effort at WSO2. And I hope to introduce uh, the WSO2 open banking solution today, uh, which we hope uh, you will find a fitting bid to take you uh, towards your uh, digital transformation of uh, the finance industry through um, this regulation that has come upon us, which is PSD2. So uh, before we uh, step into the details uh, of the solution itself, uh, let me do a quick introduction to uh, WSO2. Uh, we are an open source uh, middleware company. Um, we have, uh, we, our expertise um, revolves around five key technology areas. Um, API management, integration, identity and access management, analytics, and Internet of Things. We believe that these are the five key areas uh, that an enterprise needs to um, put in place or optimize in order to digitally transform their businesses. Uh, WSO2 uh, is a global company. We have um, over 350 uh, customers spread across different regions of the world. Uh, we have offices in uh, Mountain View, California, New York, London, Sao Paulo, and Colombo. Um, we have, we are 500 plus in staff and uh, more than 300 of us are engineers. Now, we're going to talk about Payment Service Directive 2, PSD2 today. I'm sure that I don't need to uh, define PSD2 for uh, most of the attendees today because you're here because you know what it is uh, and um, you want to uh, understand a little bit more in detail uh, about the implementation of uh, PSD2. Um, but if for the benefit of anyone who is joining this webinar to uh, really understand what PSD2 is and how this fits into um, the uh, concept of open banking, uh, I would just take, like to take a few minutes uh, to quickly introduce it and then um, go into detail uh, of functionality as well as uh, the technology requirements um, of PSD2. So, um, the Payment Service Directive 2 is a EU directive that applies to all banks operating in the EU and that is 5,382 banks at the last count. Um, and the directive regulates payment services by mandating banks to open up their customer account and payment data with customer consent to third-party payment service providers. Um, PSD2 entered into force on the 12th January 2016 and the rules apply from the 13th January 2018 which gave banks exactly two years to ensure compliance. Now one would wonder 
if banks were given two years to comply and we have only five months more to go, then why are we still talking about this um, and why are we, um, why is this still a hot topic? Well, the reason uh, is well explained, I feel, from this graph that we took from um, uh, uh, resource uh, material of the European Banking Authority. Um, even though the directive has been in force for one and a half years now, the European Banking Authority, which, is, which outlines how the directive should be implemented, uh, is issuing multiple technical specifications and guidelines on how to implement PSD2. And as you can see on your screen, uh, there are six, um, uh, six regulatory technical standards and five uh, sets of guidelines, uh, which out of which some of them uh, have been published, some are still under consideration, and some are to be finalized in the future. So with a five-month um, lookout or five-month uh, period to get uh, to, to comply, and with the implementation guidelines and details still on the way, this puts banks in a very tight spot. And most banks, uh, according to surveys that we have read and according to our conversations we've had, um, are in a position where they are not sure which vendor to go with simply because um, the capabilities that a vendor should have cannot be fully quantified at this moment. The capabilities depend on some of the requirements that are to be finalized in the future. So at this point, I would like to ask the audience to provide some feedback about the most pressing pain points that they are experiencing with respect to the journey towards PSD2 compliance. All right, so that was a very interesting uh, result as well. While a uh, majority of the uh, registrants or majority of the attendees feel that uh, uh, time and effort, cost, security and extensibility all are very important factors, uh, when you really uh, uh, slice out uh, the individual responses to the first four, security seems to be um, uh, security seems to be the largest pain point uh, and second in line is time and effort required. So our findings have been the same as well. Um, according to our um, conversations and experience with the banking industry, especially that of uh, the European banks, um, has been that the lack of clear guidance on implementation, uh, average length of IT projects are taking much more time than the time left to comply, and the fact that security cannot be compromised, especially since the data um, concerned is sensitive customer data, seem to be uh, the uh, biggest pain points for most of the banks uh, in the EU at the moment. Which means that when banks go in for a PSG2 compliance technology, they need to know that the technology can um, uh, take them towards PSG2 compliance in this very short period of time. And at the same time, that technology should have the capabilities that can provide the other requirements that are currently being um, dished out and finalized um, in order for the bank to be PSD2 compliant in the long term. Now, having said that, um,
having said that, um, let's now just take a glance at um, banking before and after the PSG2 co compliance requirement. In the old world, or in the current world, um, uh, banks basically, uh, customers and merchants uh, interact with banks um, in singular relationships. Whereas in the PSD2 world, banks open up their customers' data, payment and account information, with the customer's consent to third-party payment providers, such as payment initiation service providers and account information service providers. And the customers and the merchants can interact with the banking network through these third parties. In the pre-PSD2 world, banks enjoyed exclusive rights to customer relationship as well as customer data. However, the limited, uh, that limited the ability of new entrants to come into the market and also to provide better services and better customer experiences for the consumers. In the PSD2 world, because it mandates banks to open up their customer data in a secure manner, third parties can connect to any or all banks and provide easy banking services to customers. For example, if it is a multi-banked customer, in the previous, in, prior to PSD2, he would have to um, access multiple banks in different transactions in order to figure out his consolidated financial status. In the PSD2 world, he takes one direct interaction with an account information service provider who aggregates his financial uh, information across multiple banks and provides it to him as a service. Similarly, for payments in the, in the previous world or in the pre-PSD2 world, um, when a customer does a transaction with a merchant, uh, let's say it's an online transaction, the customer has to rely on a um, card network uh, in order to um, push the transaction through or take the payment through to the merchant's bank. But in the PSD2 world, the merchant directly interacts with the um, uh, payment initiation service provider who connects with both the merchant's bank and the customer's bank and um, uh, initiates the payment as well as ensures that the payment uh, is settled on the same day. Now, let's take a look at what the technical or the compliance requirements are um, for PSG2 compliance. So in order to comply to the PSG2 directive, banks need to um, fulfill uh, these requirements that I have listed out. Firstly, because banks are supposed to because banks are supposed to expose the customer data as uh, through APIs, um, banks need to uh, have API definitions in place uh, so that their data services uh, around payment data and account information can be exposed to third parties. Now, some banks who already expose APIs within internal departments can do this re relatively easy. However, most banks either do not currently expose APIs internally, or even if they do, they don't expose account and payment information as APIs. So the first hurdle is to come up with an API specification which the regulator, sorry, uh, is to come up with an API specification Uh, that enables the bank to expose the data out to third parties. Secondly, because this is sensitive customer data, banks must ensure that these API invocations are secured using standard protocols. 
And in order to understand how the APIs are being used, the banks also need to have considerable amount of uh, monitoring facilities to understand how the APIs, uh, the API usage is working out, um, how the throttling is happening, and have a general idea about uh, how well the APIs are being used um, by the third parties. Next, um, and one of the main concerns of uh, PSG2 compliance is the strong customer authentication that has been specified by the regulatory technical standard on uh, strong customer authentication and secure uh, communication. Uh, basically, in order to achieve strong customer authentication, uh, it requires two-factor authentication, which means um, in, in a, uh, basically in order to do multi-factor authentication, uh, you basically need to, uh, a bank needs to verify a combination of properties that confirm uh, something that the user is, something that the user knows, and something that the user possesses. So a combination of those properties is required to do multi-factor authentication. And when the RTS says two-factor authentication, they expect at least two of those different properties to be used when authenticating a user for, um, uh, in order to access their data uh, through a third party. Now, um, the RTS also talks about um, authentication mechanisms that kind of follow the adaptive authentication um, uh, set up. Once a user has logged into the bank for subsequent payments, the bank can apply certain exemptions for two-factor authentication so that the user doesn't have to go through the same process for subsequent purchases based on transaction frequency and transaction amounts. In order to do this, the bank has to have um, necessary analytics um, capabilities to understand how frequently this user is logging in or uh, the transactional patterns and map that to the identity and access management capabilities and um, basically define uh, what kind of authentication level is required at uh, each uh, transaction. Thirdly, um, the uh, RTS on strong customer authentication also specifies how consent management should be handled. Basically, after the customer logs into the bank, the bank verifies payment details and availability of funds, and then the bank must obtain customer's consent to go through with the payment. This consent has to be simple, clear, and concise so that the customer is well aware of what he is giving consent to. And uh, in a uh, AISP transaction, the customer needs to give consent uh, with respect to which details of the account and for what those details will be used. Um, in addition, there is a guideline on incident reporting details, uh, which um, identifies what kind of security in this uh, incident reporting needs to be uh, uh, is required. This includes uh, the transactions affected, um, details about server downtime, um, details about economic impact, reputational impact, etc. And finding an incident um, is uh, within these large amount of transactions that banks um, handle. Uh, in order to do that, banks have to have a necessary amount of capabilities to do anomaly detection. So a large amount of analytics uh, is required uh, in order to uh, provide incident reporting at the level that is mandated by the guidelines. Now, if you are feeling a bit overwhelmed about all the different um, requirements that you need to have with uh, your um, PSD2 compliance um, uh, mechanism, then you can relax a little bit because um, the 13th January compliance requirement is only limited towards uh, the API specific 
um, requirements. So the 13th January PSG2 compliance requirement uh, mandates banks to ensure that they expose the uh, APIs in a secure manner and is able to mon uh, monitor its usage. The strong customer authentication and the incident reporting and all the other requirements uh, only come into play after the 13th January. However, knowing that these, these other requirements are coming, um, when banks go in for a technology that provides PSD to compliance, they need to ensure that that technology will be able to manage those capabilities such as advanced identity and access management requirements, um, analytics requirements, as well as integration requirements in order to complete PSD2 compliance in the long run. So since we are now all in a race towards this um, 13th January uh, PSD2 compliance requirement, um, I want to first focus on the um, WC2 Open Banking solution, what the WC2 Open Banking solution provides uh, to be compliant by the 13th January. Uh, it uh, obviously provides API management. Um, it offers API security, including strong customer authentication, even though it is not required uh, by the 13th January. Uh, it already provides a strong customer authentication capabilities and it offers API analytics and API monetization. I'd like to focus a little bit about the requirements for 13 January um, before uh, stepping into the longer term vision and what WS2 Open Banking can do um, beyond uh, the compliance requirement for January 2018. Okay. Let's take a look at uh, the process flow that happens um, when uh, uh, a customer does a transaction at a merchant and this transaction goes through a PISP. Uh, when the customer checks out an item at the merchant's um, portal, uh, it will send a request to the payment initiation service provider, which is a PISP, and the PISP will forward or will initiate a payment and send a request to the customer's bank. Um, the customer's bank will then um, acknowledge that request uh, and um, send back a response to the PISP, at which point the PISP will redirect the user to the login page of his bank uh, in order to get the user uh, authenticated from the bank. Now, from this point on, the next few uh, messages will be done directly uh, between the user and uh, between the customer and the customer's bank. So first of all, the bank will um, authenticate the user with the first factor, which is the user's credentials. And once that is uh, successful, the bank will go ahead and get a second factor in order to um, get the user authenticated uh, as, as a strong customer authentication. So the bank will send um, maybe a PIN uh, to the mobile phone of the user and the user will provide this and confirm or verify second factor authentication. And once the user is fully uh, authenticated, the bank will then send a consent um, request to the customer where the bank will provide what the consent is taken for. So it will provide some payment information of um, this transaction uh, and ask the customer to approve the consent. So when the uh, customer approves it, then the bank um, does a token uh, exchange between the PISP and then the PISP finally uh, sends um, a payment complete um, request to the bank, at which point the bank, um, uh, bank then um, uh, settles the merchant's bank uh, and completes the transaction. Now, I'd like to show this um, process flow to you uh, through the WC2 Open Banking Solutions um, playground.
So if you go to openbanking.wso2.com, you would be able to um, visit uh, uh, Open Banking Playground where you can uh, basically um, try out the Open Banking solution. Um, I will first take you uh, through to the Guide Me, which will provide a demo uh, that takes you through this process flow that I just outlined. All right. So we have a mock shopping cart over here. This is the merchant's portal. Uh, the user will check out um, the items he wants to purchase at which point the user is uh, directed to the PISP's um, portal where the user can pick the bank that he wants to settle this transaction from. And once the user proceeds, then as you can see, the user has been redirected to the login page of his bank and when the user signs in with the credentials, he is now prompted for the second factor of the authentication process. So the user will be sent a one-time password to his mobile phone. And when he um, enters that and sends it across, the bank then requests for payment uh, by getting uh, a consent. So the user can see the amount that he is paying and is allowed to, um, uh, and is uh, is is able to either allow or deny. So if I say allow, I give the consent to go ahead with the payment, and then immediately the bank uh, uh, generates uh, or the bank exchanges token with the PISP, uh, and as explained in my process flow, it goes ahead uh, with the payment once um, it receives a payment. Uh, complete request from the PISP. So that's the that's the that's the flow uh, of how the transaction works. If you want to know how to um, basically build the API invocations that uh, uh, that are underlying this process flow, this um, getting started guide. Uh, shows you how to do it. It takes you through all the steps uh, of uh, creating an application and subscribing to APIs and then how the token generation is done, the user authentication part of it, the authorization and consent part of it, uh, and then it also um, shows you how, how to consume the APIs uh, from the perspective of a user uh, and from the perspective of, a applica uh, of an application. Um, if you go to the home page of uh, the Open Banking Playground, you can access the um, API portal and you can see the APIs that are currently available. Um, so the Accounts Information API and the Payments API are the two main APIs that are used for the AISP and the PISP flows. The Authorize API and the Token API, as the name suggests, are used to authorize and uh, handle the token generation uh, for the transaction. Uh, and the Open Bank API is an API, is a uh, unsecured API, which gives um, general open data about a bank, such as uh, its branch network, uh, its location of ATMs, uh, its uh, interest rates and exchange rates, which will be uh, in, already available in the public domain anyway. So um, as you may understand, the Account Information API and the Payments API are secured and um, you need a token to access those APIs. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about each of these APIs, you can click on um, uh, any of the APIs and you can see all the information, the resources attached, um, and you can view um, uh, uh, in detail how these APIs are structured. Um, right, so if you go back to um, the home page, we also have documentation um, on the WS2 Open Banking, so you can access that 
and understand uh, what it is and the key concepts and how it works. All right. So um, at this point, uh, since we have already um, uh, covered the PSD2 compliance requirements for January 2018, before we launch into um, the longer term view of how this uh, PSD2 uh, can be used as an opportunity for um, growth for the bank, uh, I would like to um, launch our third and final survey. Um, which would uh, capture your thoughts on the future direction for PSD2. I would like to remind um, the attendees that they can also type in their questions on the chat um, window if you have any questions and we can um, answer them uh, as and when possible. And here are the results. I think it's great news that um, a majority of the attendees uh, treat this as uh, treat PSG2 as part of a larger digital transformation strategy. That is our view as well. Um, and um, only 16% um, um, uh, will take a few extra steps to cat capitalize on opportunities, and 19% haven't thought about it. Uh, but maybe uh, from the rest of the presentation, we should be able to uh, hopefully convert um, the 35% uh, into um, seeing this as a part of a larger digital tr transformation strategy. Right. So uh, let's take a look at um, this PSD2 um, flow and this PSD2 uh, world in order to understand how banks can um, reap benefits in the long term. Now when uh, uh, in the PSD2 world when uh, these third-party payment providers um, consume APIs from multiple banks it basically uh, provides a consolidated uh, financial data, consolidated customer account and payment information across multiple banks to the third-party payment provider. Uh, so basically the third-party payment uh, provider becomes a rich resource of consolidated financial information of customers over multiple banks. Now a uh, survey that was done by Accenture in uh, within cust uh, customers in the UK or uh, banking consumers in the UK revealed that 76% of um, the survey respondents preferred these third party to be their traditional banks. So they were comfortable for uh, the existing banks to take up the role of a PISP and an AISP. Uh, for multiple reasons, um, uh, and one of the most pressing reasons was that the banks are already the guardians of the uh, financial um, the financial status and as well as the financial information of uh, the consumers, and they felt that banks are the best suited to um, have access to this consolidated uh, financial information as well which then provides a, a, a new opportunity for banks to then offer these uh, payment initiation and uh, account information services, which now enables the banks to first provide digitally transformed services to their customers uh, based on this consolidated view of finances. So for example, um, a bank originally who had 
uh, information only on the financial uh, status of a customer within that bank is now able to capitalize on that customer's financial status across banks and provide um, basically upsell and cross-sell different products, offer services, uh, offer different customer experiences based on a better understanding of the customer. In a similar fashion, banks can use this uh, rich source of financial information to provide insights, aggregated information as insights to other businesses such as airlines, restaurants, hotels, um, dealerships, supermarkets, etc. So this then brings in a new revenue stream for um, the banks and this is now made available through this uh, uh, extremely strict uh, regulatory requirement of exposing data. So for any banks that viewed um, this compliance, uh, this PSG2 compliance as a limiting factor that kind of exposed their data and that had to, uh, that they had to give away the exclusive um, relationship they had with the customer. Now it is basically opening up their doors to newer horizons where banks are now able to um, look into a larger pool of data and provide customized services uh, both to its customers as well as businesses who they didn't do business with uh, in the pre-PSD2 world. So our message is that when banks look at PSD2, they should look beyond this compliance requirement which uh, is uh, scheduled for January 2018. So basically, uh, uh, banks should look at PSD2 as a three-step process where they end up being digitally transformed. Uh, so the first step is to comply by exposing uh, customer uh, account and payment information secure in a secure manner and then uh, reclaiming the loyalty of customers by becoming a third-party service provider and finally uh, making use of that um, rich source of information that gets collected by becoming a third-party service provider to offer services beyond banking uh, to the customers, uh, to its customers and uh, its current non-customers. Now, in order to do this, uh, uh, from a technology perspective, banks need a couple of things more than API management. Uh, as we uh, spoke about the PSD2 compliance uh, part of things, uh, obviously that includes API management and uh, secure, uh, strong customer authentication. Now, when a bank becomes a third-party payment provider, it needs some further requirements. It needs the, um, it, it requires a bank to be able to integrate APIs that it's um, consuming from other banks. Uh, it also uh, requires the banks to be able to handle federated authentication because now it uh, has to uh, allow the customer to log into different other banks uh, so federated authentication then becomes a requirement. Uh, since the uh, bank is now uh, doing a payment initiation, it needs to have a very um, strong fraud detection mechanism. Uh, it requires a lot, of, a lot more of API analytics and dashboarding capabilities to understand the usage and uh, the KPIs of uh, the API usage. And in order to finally be digitally transformed, uh, you need to be able to have much more technology requirements to provide those uh, different types of uh, new services. So the WC2 Open Banking solution actually provides all of these things and is a comprehensive solution that is able to guide a bank through these different stages. First of all, it can uh, get the banks uh, complied uh, with PSD2 in a, uh, very quickly and well ahead of the uh, January 2018 requirement by uh, using its um, uh, world-renowned API manager and uh, 
basically combining that with the uh, advanced authentication mechanisms that um, uh, that it receives from the identity and access management um, technology of WSO2 uh, for uh, becoming a third party payment provider uh, the WS2 open banking solution uh, offers the API integration capabilities uh, it obviously offers a federated authentication capabilities through its um, advanced IAM uh, engine. Uh, it also provides uh, required fraud detection and analytics capabilities um, uh, through the WSO2 analytics engine. And all these things uh, are complemented with dashboards that um, highlight uh, not just usage statistics, but also business unit and KPI related statistics to understand which um, uh, part of the business is uh, bringing in uh, more revenue and um, allows the bank to optimize um, their third party um, offering based on uh, what is most profitable for the bank. Um, in terms of digital transformation, the WS2 Open Banking solution uh, uh, comes with um, a web and mobile uh, application suite which provides um, certain services that can be offered on top of the data that gets collected. Uh, it also comes with the inside sales engine, uh, which, can, which basically aggregates uh, large amounts of data and provides trends and uh, pattern uh, insights to uh, businesses. And it also comes with the required integration uh, to um, basically integrate multiple uh, sets of systems and uh, uh, provide the digital transformation that is necessary. So that is basically, uh, 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 that basically concludes uh, the, the part about the WS2 open banking solution. I just want to um, put a shout out at this point uh, to say that uh, WC2, uh, at WC2, we also um, have some other financial solutions as well. Uh, I'm just saying this because the um, attendees today are largely from the financial markets. Uh, we have a fraud detection uh, system, uh, which is based on uh, data analytics. Uh, we have a real-time uh, risk management solution, which does real-time value-at-risk computations. Uh, and we also offer a stock market surveillance product. Uh, which is also a real-time uh, uh, surveillance um, solution. Uh, we have a few more in the pipeline as well, uh, but um, these are some of the things that if uh, any of you are interested, you could uh, contact us and get on a conversation with us regarding these things. All right, so um, that would be um, all from me. And at this point, uh, I think we have received a few questions. And I'd just like to take a look at those questions and see um, which ones uh, we can um, answer within the next uh, time period we've left. OK, there are many, many questions. Um, let me take one of them. Uh, there is one question which says, what does strong customer authentication mean in WS2 open banking? Is it not something that's available within API Manager 210 product? So um, for the benefit of uh, all our attendees today, uh, WS2 has, um, as mentioned in the first slide, uh, we have um, our API Manager product, uh, which is used for um, uh, exposing APIs in a secure manner. Uh, now, the difference between the API Manager 210 or API Manager product, any version, and the WS2 Open Banking is that uh, the multi-factor authentication or the two-factor authentication requirements uh, that are necessary for strong customer authentication, as well as uh, some of the uh, adaptive authentication um, requirements that are coming up, uh, in the RTS for uh, SCA and SC are not available in API Manager because API Manager is all about the security um, capabilities of API Manager is all about uh, securing the API invocations. Uh, the strong, the, 
WC2 open banking solution basically combines that with the uh, identity and access management capabilities that is provided by our identity and access management engine uh, to provide the specific requirements of uh, two-factor authentication as well as um, uh, as well as um, adaptive authentication mechanisms that uh, we see are coming up uh, in the RTS. There's another question which says, uh, where can one uh, download and install the PSG2 solution? Uh, what kind of infrastructure do we need? So basically, the, the WC2 uh, open banking solution is not a downloadable binary like uh, our uh, usual middleware products. But you are welcome to go to openbanking.wc2.com and try out the uh, uh, try out the playground. Basically, that exposes a, um, a deployment that is running um, uh, on our cloud. Uh, the infrastructure is basically uh, this is. I mean, you can uh, you can install this on premise or uh, in the cloud. So if you if you are interested in trying this out, uh, please um, uh, contact us, and uh, we should be able to have a discussion with you uh, uh, with respect to your. Uh, requirement and then um, understand how uh, what kind of infrastructure uh, you will need and how we can help you to install this in your uh, environment. There were multiple questions about uh, the API specification, whether it is aligned with uh, the um, uh, APIs defined at openbanking.uk. Uh, well, yes, uh, we are, our API specification is aligned with that. Uh, basically, we follow um, the FAPI uh, specification, uh, and uh, you will be able to, um, if you can, um, you know, contact us. We will be able to share our API specification with you, and um, you will see that it is uh, definitely aligned to the uh, Open Banking uh, .uk standards as well. Uh, there's another interesting question which says to become a um, third party payment provider uh, PSP does it mean uh, that the third party provider and the bank must use the uh, software provided by WC2? No, not at all. Uh, if the bank is only uh, uh, only interested in PSG2 compliance, it can use the PSG2 compliance component of the WC2 open banking solution and that can be uh, used by any third party payment provider because the APIs uh, that are uh, exposed uh, using the WS2 um, open banking solution is, is a, follows a standard. Uh, now, it, there are certain banks who already have their API specifications. If a bank already has a specific uh, specification, then the open banking solution can work to expose APIs uh, through that specification. But uh, the default specification that we provide, which pr which follows the standards, is only provided for those banks who are who currently don't have uh, API definition and is um, increasingly looking for a, a, a solution that already comes with those uh, specifications already defined. Now the third party uh, provider. Um, uh, uh, technology requirements. So the WC2 open banking solution provides the ability for a bank to provide the third party um, payment uh, services as well. Uh, this does not mean that these two are tightly coupled. Um, we uh, Certain fintechs are also interested in just um, uh, using the third-party payment services uh, component of our WC2 open banking solution. So these two, um, even though they are provided by the same solution, uh, they are uh, extremely decoupled. So you can either use both or you can use one. And even if you use one, that does not restrict um, the interactions you have with um, third-party vendors who uh, have some other software by a different vendor. I think we have um, 
just time enough for, I think we've already uh, run out of time, but I'd like to answer one last question. Uh, there is a question uh, which is actually an equation. Uh, it basically asks whether WSO2 open banking equals WSO2 API manager plus WSO2 uh, identity server plus WSO2 analytics. Uh, well, yes and no. Um, it, it does it does include these three components, but it is a lot more than that. It also inter includes our integration engine, which is uh, which is a key component uh, to integrate between multiple systems in this uh, ecosystem. But the most important thing about the WS2 Open Banking solution is that it is already configured so that each of these components talk with each other, they are connected to each other so that they provide a final solution where the bank does not have to do the uh, configurations from scratch. So it comes as a already configured solution which can be fine-tuned and customized according to the bank's requirements uh, but uh, it reduces the time to uh, go into production by a large amount because all the configurations are already done as well as uh, it also obviously provides the uh, API specification etc which cannot be uh, achieved uh, when you just take the three products uh, and put them together. Uh, so I think we've had uh, quite an interesting session. Uh, my only regret is I think we've had about close to about 30 questions and we've only had enough time to answer a couple. But uh, it would be really interesting to continue this conversation with you. Uh, so please feel free to um, uh, contact us. If you go to um, uh, openbanking.wso2.com, uh, you, um, you will have a get in touch button. Um, let me just show it to you uh, right now. Um, so openbanking.wso2.com, uh, there is a button to get in touch with us. Um, so please fill in the form and contact us uh, so that we can continue this conversation with you. Uh, it would be really interesting to share our experience working with um, large banking and financial sector customers uh, in this space. Um, as well as to learn from you about your pain points and how well we can customize our solution to um, provide uh, the answers to the questions uh, that are bothering you right now. Uh, with five months uh, down for the compliance um, uh, requirement, there is no time to waste. So uh, please do contact us uh, and um, thank you very much uh, for joining this webinar.